Hello, students. I hope you're doing fine. Can you all hear me and see me? Can you type in a message whether it is okay? Okay, good to hear that. Today we have a presentation about qualitative research. I hope so far you have acquired knowledge about the quantitative research. So today we will be focused on qualitative research and some differences between qualitative and quantitative research. So what is the agenda for today? We will talk about some basic principles of research design, which will outline also differences between qualitative and quantitative research. Then we will continue with sampling for qualitative research, what types of interviews exist, how to ask questions in qualitative research and in interviews, and at the end, we will talk about analyzing qualitative data. If you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to write me a question on the board. Okay, so we can start. In order to make you familiar with the qualitative research, but also, as I said, to outline some differences with quantitative research, first we will have to go back to the roots in, in philosophy. And I will explain some basic principles, which some of you might know already. And I will talk a little bit about ontology, epistemology, methodology, and some methods and techniques which are used. So these are the four main features of a research design. They are distinct, but they are also uh, very closely related. First, we will talk about ontology. Maybe you all learned about this in philosophy in high school, maybe at the university, but we will just repeat something that you already know. Ontology is actually how you view the world, and it's about the assumptions that you make, how you will, how, how the reality functions actually, and what is the nature of the world, how you build those assumption, assumptions. On the next slide, I will show you different uh, schools, different directions in ontology, and how they are related with research. On the other hand, we have the epistemology, that is the assumptions that you make, how to research the world, how to investigate what is going on, what is the reality. And then we have the methodology, of course, which is the way you group your research techniques to make the picture out of it, and the end, we have the methods and techniques that you actually do, that you actually conduct in order to collect the data and to carry it out what you investigate. So these are some of the core principles which actually form your opinion about what is the world made of, what is science, what are the issues, problems that need to be explored, answered, and how you how all this fits into a bigger picture of the world, how you actually see the world. Now you will see what am I talking about. If you have any question so far, please feel free to interrupt me. As I said previously, there are four main schools of ontology and this is, as I said at the beginning, how we construct reality. And those are realism, internal realism, relativism, and nominalism. None of these are absolutes. It's a rather their own continuum with some overlaps between them. And we will very briefly say a few words about each. The first one are realists, knife realism, which think, talk, 
that the world is real and the science should observe it, should examine it, and they say that there is only one truth in the world. And regarding the facts, facts exist, we just need to see them, they can be revealed with experiments. This fits to the concept mostly of natural sciences, like in physics, in other, where with experiments you can actually find the truth. And as I said at the beginning, according to this school, there is one single truth. On the other hand, we have the internal realism, which is similar to realism, naive realism, to the first one, but they say the world is real, but it is very hard, it is impossible to examine it directly. Uh, the truth exists, but it's obscure, we cannot see it. There are some facts, and we can see just part of them, and they cannot always be revealed. Uh, to illustrate this, uh, I will tell the story of the six blind wise men. Maybe you heard this story so far already. Each of the wise men was touching an elephant. One was touching the trump, the other was touching one, the stomach, the left leg, the right leg, etc. And they were saying that, what is the elephant? And each answered, elephant is the trump, elephant is the left leg, elephant is the right leg, the tail, etc. They all could touch the truth, but none of them has the whole truth, the absolute truth. And they cannot always be revealed. The next one, the third one, is relativism. And they say that the laws are created by the people, the order is created by the people to fit their view of the reality to serve to the society. There is not a single truth. There are many truths, and each one is real. Depends who is saying this. And actually, the facts depend on the viewpoint of the observer, which can be illustrated through the sentence that beauty is in the eye of the beer holder, for example. And the last but not least is nominalism, and they say that uh, reality is created by people, there is no external truth, there is no truth at all, actually, and I must say that these are mentally held people, some of them are even physicists, they say that facts are all created by humans, facts are all human, crea human creations. So, so far we have seen these four schools, I hope you you understand them. If not, you can also read about them online. Realism, internal realism, relativism, and nominalism. And related with them, we have the epistemology, which is the way that you choose how you can investigate the world around you. Basically, there are two main schools in epistemology, which are positivism and social constructionism. Is anyone aware of this term? Have you heard of these two terms before? Maybe there are more, you're more familiar with these two terms. No? Positivism, constructionism. Anyone knows what they mean? Maida? Maybe? No? Okay. Then I will start, start briefly explaining. Actually, positivists believe that the best way to investigate is through objective methods, some external methods, such as observations. And this fits with the realists, realists ontology. Okay, someone is typing a message. Okay, positivists, positivists, as I said, think that there is a single truth and that we can discover it 
through objective methods. On the other hand, we have the social constructionists. They believe that the reality does not exist by itself. It is constructed and given meaning, the meaning of reality is given by the people. It's actually serve people. Everyone has its own reality, and the focus, therefore, on the other hand, is on feelings, beliefs, what we believe in, what the world looks like in our eyes, in our brain, and how people communicate, how they transfer this message, this view that they have of the world to, to the others. And they fit, on the other hand, to the relativist ontology. So we have the realists and the relativists. As the name says, constructionism, the reality is constructed. On the other hand, we have the positivists, the realists, which say that the, re the reality can be revealed. I hope it is more clear now. And now the third part, as I said, they are all inter interrelated between them. So the first, how we, we see the world, the picture of the world, what is the best way to research, to discover the world, and we have the methodology. And they have implications which are consistent to the previous two schools. So realists, they tend to have this positivist approach that the world is real, and we should gather quantitative data, meaning data that is measurable, that's something that we can measure. For example, how many years have you studied in education? What is your salary? How many kilometers did you travel today? How much did you spend today? How many cigarettes did you smoke? So these are all figures. This can be explained and measured in figures. On the other hand, we have the relativists, which tend to have the social constructionist approach. And we will talk about this today, about qualitative data, data some qualitative sources of data. And remember that these two are not absolute, but they work, they are usually uh, examined on a continuum, and we can combine them in order to get to, to get to the truth. And it depends to which truth. As I said, the constructionists say there is no single truth. On the other hand, the positivists tend to say that there is one single truth, that just we need to, to discover it. And related to issue is the methods and techniques that, that you will use or that are used in social sciences. Regarding the qualitative approach, this is approach that, as I said at the beginning, contrary on the quantitative, doesn't include numbers, numerical data. Instead, it is focused on words, what people say, how they say it, how they express it. Nonverbal communication also is very important. It can be done, the analysis on pictures, on photos, videos that people uh, produce, audio recordings, etc. Maybe you've heard about the research of Margaret Mead, and this is how it all started. It was mostly in ethnography when she went to some different uh, distant villages to discover about the civilizations that lived there. And what she found out was that in some villages, when um, a very close member of the family dies, uh, people cut one finger from their hand. Can you imagine? But from their perspective, they say that the first time it hurts a lot, but then with each cut finger, it represents a special meaning for them. So by the end of their life, they have no fingers. So you can imagine uh, how hard for them is to, to live like that but they have a special meaning that people like us, that we have a different view of the world, we cannot maybe understand this if, we don't, we, if we're not put in their, in their culture, tradition, etc. Uh, the qualitative approach 
tends to start with a broad question rather than a specific hypothesis that we have in quantitative research. That there is some hypothesis, we will test it, and at the end we have the answer, yes or not, it is confirmed or not. In qualitative approach, they tend to develop uh, theory rather than start uh, with one. And the approach is inductive, as we will talk also on the, on the next uh, slides as well. It is inductive rather than deductive, meaning that we start from the data, digging the data in order to find some reasons about the behavior, the patterns, or what we, we explore. The data is very rich, meaning that we can explore the process, how it's happening, why it is happening like that, like it is happening. And here we don't need some large sample size that we need to, to detect or to confirm our hypothesis or not confirm it. But also there are some issues that could arise, but we will not talk about them in detail today, but we will mention some of them. Respondents sometimes can provide accurate or false information. They could be very close to us, seeing what we want to hear as researchers. Ethical issues are very important here. They could be very problematic because we will ask some sensitive information for them to provide. Uh, ethical issues are part of the last webinar that we will have next week. And also they're related with your last assignment that you have to prepare, uh, but we will talk also about that on the next class. For today, the today's assignment is for the next week as well. The assignment that you will have today is to prepare a discussion guide for interview, like you're making an interview with some expert on the topic. And you will find that on the next slide, uh, how to create that. And researcher objectivity can be more difficult to achieve. So, for example, I'm examining it is I'm examining uh, the traditional gender roles, and I'm feminist. So, I will tend to find the results that are in light that are in line with my views. I hope this is clear, and therefore. In my explanation, I should state that my views are that I support feminists or I don't support it, but I explore traditional gender roles. And the researcher should, should say this in front before the research and should clearly state it in the paper so we, the readers, can actually evaluate it, what is based on his views as a feminist and what is, what is actually the reality. Some sources of qualitative data. It could be done through interviews, which are structured, semi-structured, and unstructured. I will explain each of them in the second part of my presentation. There are focus groups, which is a discussion of six to eight people that are gathered to talk on a different topic, for example, consumption of uh, wine, usage of some banking services, telecommunication services, also about some attitudes toward the, uh, the world, attitudes whether you are pro or against European Union. We have some also questionnaires or surveys that can be included. Apart from this, the qualitative research is good in content analysis. This is part of the analysis that will be uh, explained on the, on the last slides. For example, we can take one book and book, for example, for uh, pupils in third grade, and we can discover how traditional gender roles are portrayed in this book. We can discover the, the content behind that or some different uh, company reports, or I don't know, some events can also be analyzed, whether they're taped or audio, uh, they're audio recorded or different data. Some direct observation, which can be 
hidden or participant. They know that we are participants of the, of the research, the respondents who are under in investigation, or it could be hidden. We're not telling them that we are researching them. For example, like I mentioned the case of Margaret Mead, who is examining this, uh, these villages. Yes, case study can be a source of qualitative data. It is actually used uh, many times in uh, qualitative data. It depends uh, on the methods, actually, that you use. You can use it in combination with uh, quantitative data, or you can use it alone just to, to give, just to give overview of the reality that you think is going on in some company, or it depends if uh, it could be a campaign, or it could be a book, as I said, or a web page. And at the end, we have the ethnography approach, where uh, where the respondents actually go and live with the participants and record the conversation and they they are focused on the words exactly as they say it and the implicit meaning the the words have for the for the respondents not not only the meanings but also the patterns of behavior and artifacts that they are using in in their daily life Now, I will outline some differences regarding qualitative versus quantitative approach, what you have heard so far, so you can be able to, to distinguish uh, these, two, these two approaches. Qualitative is usually non-probability based sampling, meaning that we cannot make valid conclusions about the whole population of 18 plus voters in Macedonia, for example, if we are if we are examining vo voting behavior. On the other hand, a quantitative is a typically probability-based sampling, means that every person has uh, the same probability to enter into the sample. Usually, the sample is big, 1,000 respondents for two millions, etc. And the quantitative research is generalized, generalizable, meaning that from the conclusions that you got on your sample, you can draw valid conclusions for the population of interest. On the other hand, the qualitative is non-generalizable, uh, meaning that the conclusions are valid only for the specific group of interests. The qualitative research is focused on questions like, why is this happening, how it is how it's happening, uh, whether they're related or not, how they're related, whether some individuals are related or not. On the other hand, as I said, quantitative is based on numbers, based on numerical data. It answers how many, when, where, etc. Qualitative happens in earliest fa earlier phases when you want to, to discover some new theory. It's rather formative. While on the other hand, quantitative it's in the later phase of research when you want to test some already established uh, theory and you will try to test them through your, uh, your quantitative research. As I said, for qualitative research, uh, the data are very rich, but they're also very time consuming to analyze and the report usually starts when you start doing the interview. The report starts immediately. And you can also go back, change the sample. For example, in one research that was done in, in the Nordic, Nordic countries, I think it was in Sweden, they wanted to examine the behavior of people that, that are drunk in bars. So they went there, they started interviewing, they just focused on the beginning on both genders, but at the end they finished only with males. But when they made a profound analysis and they wanted to focus only on those who are drunk almost every day. So what was their founding? Because they excluded those who are drunk every two or three days. And their finding was that those 
who are drunk every day were most likely to be divorced. This was one of their general findings of the research. On the other hand, the quantitative research, uh, data are more efficient, they could miss the context, and the, the re writing of report starts when you finish collecting data. While on the other hand, in qualitative research, the writing of report starts when you start doing your first interview. As I said, in qualitative research, you can change the design. If it doesn't function, you can change the sampling. While in quantitative, you cannot do this unless you make a pilot research. In qualitative, as I said, what I was talking about today, why the ontology is important in different types of uh, reality, because researcher is the instrument here. What he, she sees through his own eyes, actually with his own uh, mind, is transferred into the, the paper that he's writing, that he's trying to present to others. And at the end of the presentation, we will see why some do this, why qualitative research is used. On the other hand, quantitative research uses various tools like questionnaires that need to have a certain psychometric characteristics that should always be re reliable, valid, and we have some external instruments that are used. I hope this distinction is clear regarding qualitative and quantitative approach that are used in social sciences. Do you have any specific questions so far regarding the, the both approaches. Uh, maybe you already can draft some, some guide based on your experience that you want to capture some details why people are buying uh, bitcoins, for example. There was one, uh, one uh, case study that was presented in, in, in Profman. Okay, no questions. So we can continue. Sampling for qualitative research is a bit different than sampling for quantitative. This is related to the goal, to the aim of the research. Our aim here is to understand from within the subjective reality of the participants which are included in the study. So, and this cannot be achieved via some superficial knowledge about some big sample that we will explore on individuals. Rather, we're talking with uh, people here which can share the experience. They are, they have profound experience. They share their, uh, their meaning of the world, their view of the world, their beliefs. So everything that we get from them transfers their reality as they see it. And there are many different types of qualitative research. And as I said, size is not important here, meaning you're not starting with some predefined sample size. I will explore I will investigate 100 respondents, conduct a survey on 500. No, you can start with 10, 20, should be enough. You can go back, you can say, no, 15 is enough. There is one rule here, which is called the saturation rule. And the rule is that you continue to sample until the information starts to repeat, meaning that you're not getting any new information. The information is already saturated and you're not gaining new, insi new insights, and then this is the limit, this is the point where you decide to finish. Here I have stated many types, around 20, known uh, sampling in qualitative research, that can be used, we will spend in a minute or less explaining each of them, when they're used, how they're used, which cases we have convenience sampling, theoretical sample, 
different than theory sample. We have the purposive sampling, judgmental, snowball sample, friend of a friend, extreme or deviant case, intensity sample. We have the maximum variation sample, homogeneous, typical case, stratified purposeful. We have the critical case sample, key informant sample, criterion sample, confirming or disconfirming sample, opportunistic, random purposeful, <coughs> politically important cases, volunteer sampling, and at the end we have some combination. I would like to ask you here a question, whether you, have you heard about any sample mentioned here before? Has anyone heard in his life during his studies, maybe online? Snowball. Oh, it's snow. Yeah. In Macedonia, we had snow two days ago, but now it's melted. So Maida, please explain us, share with us uh, what snowball sample means. Maybe you already have snow in Sarajevo. It's good that the people are active and, I mean, this is not a typical presentation. We should interact. Okay, how do you find them? This is usually used with people that are hard to reach. Yeah, it's a good start. You had some people that already know you knew them and you went to them and they had good experience. Okay, please continue. It's good that you're active. I always support active learning and interaction after their good experience you did what and they told your friends where you can find other people yeah so the ball starts rolling in it gets bigger and bigger and they yeah they believe in you the ball gets bigger and bigger, so you find more and more people. Yeah, this is correct. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Maida. Anyone else? Come on, people, wake up. It's 7.30 p.m. Okay, I will, co I will continue in interest of time. First one is convenience sample. We think that they are representative of the population, but these are people who are at the right place and at the right time. These are people who are very close to us. They are at hand. We can call them anytime. They are very convenient at the researcher, but what is wrong with this approach is that it is biased. Those who are here, if you're a doctor, you just call those patients that you have. This saves time, money, and effort. But we don't have credibility. How to explain why did we chose those people? This is the least rigorous technique. Involves those who are most accessible to us. As I said, it's good that we save time, efforts, resources, but we can end up with some poor quality data. Uh, and usually <clears throat> the selection of the respondents should be justified in any way. So now we continue with the theoretical sample. 
which is different than theory sample. Theory sample <coughs> comes from a theory based on some theory of resilience, for, for example. I predict that you will be in that theory, and that's why, based on that criteria, you are in the sample. And it depends, Philip. Uh, sometimes we use less resources with convenient sample because they are at our hand. In uh, snowball sample, we have to, they have to believe us, and they have to, <clears throat> to point some other people to us. Referral, yeah, this is the same. It's a snowball sample. Theoretical sample on or the head and on the other hand is a process of data collection where <clears throat> we can choose some, some sample and from this sample we're trying to build a new theory about how the world functions, how the world is built. And we try to, to, to gather some data and we try to group them and it depends from which sample did we choose. We, we chose this. That's why it is called theoretical sample. It is related to ground theory. And I will speak about this at the end of this presentation. So I don't want to mix it now. But as I said at the beginning, it is different than theory sample, which based on some theory, you're put into a, some sample. We have the purposive sample. It's judg judgmental. So based on the judgment of the researcher, that sample tends to be representative of the population, and therefore they are included in, <clears throat> in our research into our sample. Uh, we came to the snowball sample, friend of a friend. As Maida talked, Philip mentioned referrals. Uh, we initially found some people who are potential respondents, asked them to participate in our interview. They agree, they participate, and they know person with the same characteristics that we're looking, so they referred us to them. For example, want to interview some vegetarians, they know some other vegetarians, people with, uh, who support some political party, or this is usually done with people who are drug addict, addicts, so they point us to another person and etc. So the ball is rolling. So I hope we will have snow next week. So now we are finished with the uh, snowball sample and we will continue with extreme or deviant case. As the name suggests, <clears throat> here we learn from those who are on the extremes, meaning that they have high achievements, very high, or very low achievements from regarding the phenomenon of interest. We have some outstanding cases, uh, very successful persons, or some failures, or some, some startups, some top of the class. We have some exotic events sometimes could be, could be analyzed, or, or a crisis as an extreme or divine case. And here, for example, we, we take information from cases which are problematic, very problematic or especially good. And what is the logic behind this? The logic is that they could provide a rich source of information regarding the phenomena of interest that we're trying to research. The logic, is, the logic here is pretty much clear. The next sample that we will talk about is intensity. It is different than uh, extreme cases, because in this case, we, we don't want to have the, those who are at the extremes, but rather than we want to have those who have very intense experience, such as good students, poor students. You can easily uh, think of this as extreme cases are, for example, if you want to study <coughs> loneliness, for example, extreme cases or divine cases are people who live in isolation. So this, this will be not an area of our interest, but, but rather we are looking for persons who have a, a feeling of loneliness, who live not isolated, but 
who experience at the moment uh, loneliness. So this is actually the difference between extreme case and, ex and experiencing intense, intense, intensely the phenomenon of, of interest. Maximum variation. Maximum variation is something that is used a lot, and we're picking actually a wide spectrum of variation of dimensions of interests. We can do this on documents, on, on other. We want to find different patterns across different dimensions. For example, we have various circumstances that could vary from the lowest to the highest, and we want to see whether there is some pattern in all of them. For example, we can get uh, different cases that are on, on, on one dimension are very different. For example, if we explore some village or some city, we, we will take the largest city, the median city, and the smallest city. We will take uh, different, whether it is from urban area, from rural area, etc. I mean, you know, some settlement that we want to discover. And the idea here is to see, to get information about all different patterns that, that emerge through different cases. On the other hand, uh, opposite to the maximum uh, sample, we have the homogeneous sample. And when we start with some research, we're not familiar with the topic, for example, abortion. And we're rather than focused, we want to, to see why girls want to have abortion and we want to to find a homogeneous group for example uh, girls on the same age girls that have or women that have uh, that have the same socio socioeconomic status and we <coughs> actually uh, we actually take a similar cases and they're homogeneous on all these aspects and then we talk with them about their motives and this is, it reduces variation. We're focused on our uh, topic of interest, and this facilitates group interviewing, meaning there's, they have similar interests so they can more easily talk and open. The typical case, the situation is clear, illustrates what is typical, what is the average. It, it is selected because it is not a typical, deviant, or intensely unusual uh, when we want to explore the patterns among typical respondents or typical, uh, I don't know, settlements. And it is usually used when we present to someone who is not familiar with the area of research, who are new in the area. So the typical case is actually what everybody does, then this should be valid for the typical case. Stratified purposeful uh, sample, we divide two groups into stratas and stratums, and then we want to find their different views on, on something. They're similar to uh, statistically stratified sampling, but they're not the same because this is not representative. So actually here we want to see the, for example, if we divide the sample of male in, on male and female, then we want to find out what are the difference between them on some topic of interest. We have the critical case. The critical case you can imagine as a person who fits on some scale. And what is true for this person, it's true for all the others. For example, a person who has the lowest scholarship and whether if he is satisfied with the amount of scholarship, then we should think that all others should be satisfied with the amount of scholarship they receive, with the amount of scholarship the student receives. And if this is valid for this case, then it should apply to all cases that are above him. Or if it's not valid for this, then it's not valid for all the other cases. Key informant uh, sample. It's a very interesting sample. It is used uh, a lot. Key informants are people who are respected in the community, 
who are familiar with the community, they have some position and they have some insights about what is going on in the, going on in the community. I will mention uh, priests here in the past that were some source of information. What are the characteristics of an ideal key informant is that he has some role in the community, that, he, that she, he fulfills. He's familiar with the community. They all know him. He knows, she knows them. He's willing to participate and give you the, the resources, the information that you're asking from him. He can, she can communicate clearly. And it's good that this person, if this person can provide unbiased information. Now we have the criterion sample, which is uh, based on criteria that you will set. If some people fall in this criteria, then they are <clears throat> part of our sample. For example, former clients of an in intensive care unit, and they return after three weeks with the same complaint, they could constitute some sample for additional qualitative study. All cases that meet certain criteria. And this will give us an overview of the effectiveness of the intensive care program, for example, in this case, what I mentioned here. Confirming or disconfirming a sample is when we want to find exceptions from our theory, from our hypothesis, and we would want to see how these persons behave, whether they're different or not. Confirming means that they confirm with our theory. On the other hand, we have the disconfirming sample, and they're different, and they cannot uh, fit in our theory. And we're just testing variations of our theory here. We have the opportunistic sample, which is very interesting, similar to Snowball, but it's not Snowball. For example, we want to recruit participants for patients who go to cardiologists and like to talk not with the patients, but with the cardiologist. And the cardiologist actually refer us to other cardiologists who then can refer us to, <clears throat> then can refer their clients, their patients to us. That's why we call it opportunistics, because we use the opportunity to, to get to our, to our respondents of interests. We have the random purposeful research. This is when we want to add credibility to our research. We have a lot of participants, but we don't know how to select. And in order to be more, uh, the selection to be more justifiable, to show that we use some scientific means, then we make a random selection. We made simple random selection of those respondents whom we have at our disposal. And this reduces judgment. It's not for generalization or representatives. It just, it's a small sample size, but just adds credibility to our research, to our sample. We have the politically important cases when we want to include or to avoid, on the other hand, some, some politically sensitive cases, politically meaning for, for some issue, some person could be important. And if you want to get attention in our study, we should ask this person definitively. But also, if you don't want to attract attention on our study, then we're not talking to this person. The volunteer sampling actually is similar to convenient sample, but it is different because volunteer, this person voluntarily want to make want to participate in our research, we can put some ad on the website or in a newspaper. We can advertise and we request people to volunteer to participate in the study. This is useful when they are dispersed throughout the country or it's difficult to contact them directly, but they are typically biased. For example, volunteer sample of people living with AIDS, with HIV could systematically be biased because it excludes people who are denied or they ignore their, their current status. 
And at the end, we have the combination, which is mixed purposeful. The triangula triangulation is a method when we want to see whether the same pattern, whether we get to the same pattern via different methods, where qualitative, quantitative, or with different uh, samples. Now I will speak a little about qualitative versus quantitative interviewing. Quantitative involves a rigid set of questions, while on the other hand, with qualitative, they are rather open set of questions with no fixed response. For qualitative research, questions are framed by the interest information of the participants. They speak on their, with their voice, with their words. Uh, fresh insights could be, could be gathered, but they're more difficult to, to analyze. On the other hand, with the quantitative, some options could be relevant to participants, and that's, that's why we use filter questions, which some of you did not use in the, in the quantitative research. We have limited opportunities, and the researcher is often biased when he designs some items. There are three types of interviews, generally standardized, semi-structured, or unstructured interviews. Unstructures are mostly used. In standardized interview, actually we have a set of question, a set, a pre set of question and set order. The wording we should read exactly it is written. No adjustment should be made ex ex except from some explanations. No additional questions are allowed. It's similar to quantitative research. On the other hand, we have the semi standardized interview. It is more or less structured, but there is some flexible order. Wording is adapted. Additional questions sometimes could be allowed, and some new items could be actually be, be inserted, some others could be dropped, and at the end, we have the unstandardized interview, which is completely unstructured with some open-ended questions, back and forth via different questions, there is no order, and topics could change based on earlier interviews. Regarding the, the questions, we have uh, two types of questions. We have the essential questions, which are related to our topic of interest, and we have the throwaway questions. Essential questions are, as the name suggests, they're crucial for our research. We try to order them, to group them, and we try to, to ask additional follow-up questions in order to check whether the respondents lie to us, whether the, the information that they provide we ask the same question, but in different words, with different manner, whether we, to see whether we will get the same answer. On the other hand, we have the throwaway question, when the situations uh, escalate, and we try to actually de-escalate the situation, it, and we throw in some similar question to the topic of interest. We actually ask something which we think they like, they, they, they are used for providing context and to redirect respondents from upsetting to engage them. Here, uh, what is very important in, co in qualitative research are probes. We're always trying to probe to get more additional information. So try to develop this for each uh, question, how to probe. For example, if I ask you, how do you feel that there are so few male students in the Profman class? And you say, it's okay. And then ask, oh, what do you mean by okay? And then you start explaining or ask, how come? And here what is usually used is silence. This is a great probe. People cannot stand and they, they avoid it. So sometimes you just ask them and, and wait in order to get the, the answer out of them. Or sometimes it's usually repeat what they say and ask them what they can say more about what you just actually repeat. You just, you just actually repeat it. And we have came to the, to the end of our today's webinar. We will talk a little bit about analyzing the data you should know about these different types. There is a content analysis, grounded analysis, social network analysis. We have the discourse analysis, 
we have the narrative analysis, and the end we have the last but not least conversation analysis. We will say a few words about each, and then you can go and work on your homework, which is you have to develop a discussion guide, qualitative uh, discussion guide that we will guide you through an interview with expert on the topic of interest that you already uh, chose for this uh, for the previous assignments. Content analysis, as I said previously, is when we are trying to find some ideas or hypotheses, themes. We actually examining the content of a book, a web page, some written material, whether to to see whether the topic that we're exploring is there, uh, in what in intensity is there, and what does it say about some book, whether there is a traditional gender roles they explain or not, and sometimes uh, different color coding or different systems could be used to identify the different topics, themes that emerge. You can group them, and but the main idea is to find some themes that are present in the content of the of the source that you are exploring. The next is the grounded analysis, which is similar to content analysis, but as I said at the beginning. You do not start from a theory or something. You just start digging the data. You allow the data to speak for, for themselves and what will emerge from the data. And you try to build theory out of the, the ground, the theory. It's very hard to achieve because it, it requires that you put everything that you have read so far and just concentrate on the data. Social network analysis is usual. We want to identify links between respondents, between individuals, as a way of to understand them what motivates actually their behavior. It is used why people are more successful at work than others, whether they are they have good company or not, why some people, why some students run away from home. It is used also in combination with uh, with other methods. We have the discourse analysis which analyze actually the contents in which the, conserva the, conservation, the conversations are made, includes previous conversation, as well power relationships that exist, the context between the respondents of interest. We have a question here, I think, and also identity. As I said, nonverbal communication is what is the discourse, what is the, the social context that, that is trying to, to present the analysis. Here we have a question. We are at the very end of the today's webinar. OK. Uh, it doesn't have to be necessarily focus group. But it could be interview with one expert, focus group, sexual discussion group, yeah. But the topic is organic food market, and you should develop discussion guide on the topic of, in your case, organic food market. Yes. I will continue now with the presentation. We have two more. Thank you, Anita, for the question. It was a very good question for the others as well to understand. I also support uh, those who are active and those who are present at the webinars, and I, I also try to motivate them via additional points that I will give them at the end. We have the narrative analysis, and this is actually the way stories are told in organization, in society, in some business, how they are actually transferred, transmitted to other members, and there are actually four main types, bureaucratic, which is highly structured and logical. It's about power and control. The same control should remain from the top. Quests, where the ambition is to have the most compelling story, and it should lead others to success. We have the chaos story, where the story is lived rather than it's told. And at the end, we have the postmodern 
stories, which is similar like uh, chaos narratives. Apart from that, it is lived. The narrator is aware about the story and what they're trying to achieve. They're trying to construct a different reality. As if you remember at the beginning, the social const constructionists say that the reality is constructed and they want to, to make a social change. And at the end, the last but not least is the conversation analysis, which is uh, largely used in ethnographic research. It assumes that some conversation underlies some rules and patterns which remain the same whoever is talking. And it can be understood by what it was told before, what was told after. We're trying to, to analyze, to make a detailed analysis of data, but also on, on the way how that was said. And here we have the ethnography where the, the researcher actually lives with the respondents. That would be all, all for today. Thank you for uh, your attention. Deadline for next assignment is Monday. If you have any question or... Okay, then we'll be in touch. I wish you a pleasant work. Goodbye.